Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's DM Radio Deep Dive. Are you our data lakes excuse me, modern data pipelines, improving speed, governance and analysis, sponsored today by Five Tram. It is a deep dive and continuing conversation from a live DM radio broadcast a few weeks ago, which in case you missed, you can listen to it on demand at dmradio.biz under podcasts. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. And for questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DM Radio. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn the webinar over to Eric Cavanaugh, the host of DM Radio, to introduce today's webinar and speaker. Eric, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon, and thanks to all of you out there for joining us today for another DM Radio Deep Dive. Yes, indeed. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I'll be presenting today with Taylor Brown, who has done some really fascinating stuff over at Fivetran, and he's going to tell us about kind of how we got here and why modern data pipelines are so important for the future of business, quite frankly, not just for our industry, but for business at large. So let's get some context from recent events. Just yesterday, General Electric gets booted from the Dow. Wow, how did that happen? Anyone remember about 10 years ago or less, in fact, when GE was gonna be the, the right-hand man to government innovation? There was a lot of hope, a lot of prosperity in the mix. People really had good ideas about where things were going, and now they just got booted from the Dow. Well, lots of reasons for that, obviously, but I can tell you one thing for sure is that inertia is a killer inside large organizations. Inertia really prevents agility, and there are all kinds of reasons why that happens, but I guarantee there are people inside GE who saw this coming and have been working feverishly to right the ship to get it going in a better direction, and guess what? It just wasn't enough. So why is this happening? Well, in our industry, we play a pretty significant role. We can really help large organizations right the wrongs, get back on track, and find new directions. That's all through the classic use case of data management, of getting data into analytical environments, of operationalizing those environments, tying analysis to operations of businesses. All of these things are really important. But again, how did we get here? Well, let's think about a couple things. Constraints drive design. This is true across any architectural landscape, whether you're talking about information systems or traditional architecture. I know that uh, from years ago in my reporting history, I did a story on some highway improvements up in Illinois, and one of the guys from the Illinois Department of Transportation explained to me that at least back then, and I'm pretty sure it's still the same, you can only plan out new highways according to existing traffic patterns. In other words, you're not allowed to predict how traffic might change once a new highway is put into place and use that as your basis for justifying a new highway project. You have to look at existing traffic patterns and base it on that. Well, that may not be effective enough in the world of information management. As we see the raw amounts of data and all the different data types coalescing around us, we have to realize we need a new way of getting this information into the systems that drive analysis and that drive the business. And there are lots of other things that are happening too. Moore's Law, we've talked about that for years. Well, Moore's Law, in its original form at least, is fading. We can't get any more power out of these little processors. That's why massive parallelism is better. So let's think about this too, <laughs> application retirement, right? This is something we've talked about for years, and it's really never happened. I have a famous the wise crack from a good buddy of mine, Gilbert Van Cutsen, who joked a few years ago that elephants go to a special place to die, but there is no software graveyard. He said it all just goes to the cloud. Well, that can work if you port the data and you port the applications and all the workloads to the cloud. That's what we're talking about at the DataWorks Summit right now in San Jose. I'm dialing in from the hotel room. That's all taking place right now, and really in the last 18 months, large organizations have finally gotten serious about moving to the cloud. It is the future, at least it's the near-term future. There may be interesting ways that the extent data centers will be renovated and 
remodeled and refurbished and reused and so forth. But right now, people are moving to the cloud. There's a lot of gravity up there. And that's in part because there are so many applications now in the cloud. If you want to avoid the fate of GE, if you want your enterprise to rise and shine and do better and better each day and each week and each month and year, you need to be using these new data sources. And they are everywhere and they are huge. That's why modern data pipelines are so important. So let's talk about real world architecture buildings, right? Architecture matters. The keystone, you can see all throughout these arches in the Colosseum, the keystone holds that whole archway together. Old world architecture, hey, may not have been as good as the stuff we have these days, but the Colosseum is like 2,000 years old and it's still standing. So if you come up with a good architecture for your ideas, for your business, for your information landscape, you're gonna have some pretty good success. Well, let's think about what's happening these days. These are the modern skyscrapers, the Sears Tower. I actually watched that go up because I grew up in Chicago, and I remember seeing it at various stages of its development. It was an amazing thing to witness. I was only, I think, seven years old when the Sears Tower went up. And, of course, that's Freedom Tower in the middle. And then the, uh, the, the new, the tallest building in the world, frankly, Khalif Tower. And it was going to be called the, uh, the Dubai Tower. I'll talk about that in a second. But the point of this, this slide right here is to, is to mention that you cannot build skyscrapers with bricks and mortar. It's just not going to happen. They're going to collapse under their own weight. We needed a revolution in engineering in order to be able to build skyscrapers, standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. And look at how amazing they are today. The Sears Tower was amazing back then, 40-odd years ago. But the Freedom Tower and then this new, the tallest building in the world is just amazing and magnificent. And I would argue we're in the same kind of scenario right now with information landscapes and information design, where you cannot build web scale applications using the old tools. You cannot build it using old data warehousing technology, legacy ETL, for example. All that stuff needs to change if you're going to graduate to the next level of big business driven by data. But there are some new exciting problems that are going to arise. And I love this story. It's further proof in my half joke that we're living in the matrix. This was the Dubai torch, which caught on fire, <laughs> right? And I don't know if you heard the story, but something about the material that was used on the outside of the building was just not engineered very wisely, and it caught fire, and it was a huge problem. So there are lots of things to worry about in this new age of information design, this new age of, let's call it skyscrapers for data management systems. And some of the old issues still matter as well. Don't forget about the costs. Don't forget about the basics. So modern solutions have cost structures too. This is a story about that particular tower and how the guys who were building it ran out of money when they were about two thirds of the way through. So they had to borrow a whole bunch of money from their neighbor and that's why they changed the name of the tower. So the old rules matter, the old things like financing, like thinking through your project and making sure you have some buffers involved. You got to think through all that stuff, get your early stage success stories, and then move on from there. And communicate. You really need to share plans with all of your stakeholders. Good communication is really highly underrated, I think, and it's really important to get multiple members from your team on board in the project. Find out what they want. What's going to make them happy? How are you going to make them successful? These are all really important considerations to take into mind when you're designing these new skyscrapers of information systems. And remember that process is always the key, right? Process is what everything boils down to in business. And what we're seeing right now is a reinvention of business processes. We're seeing processes collapsed, not just streamlined, but taken down from weeks or days into minutes or seconds. And that's just amazing stuff. And it's going to shake out throughout the entire organization step by step, bit by bit. And as you think about how to leverage these new technologies, as you think about how to make use of these skyscrapers of information systems, just remember that you have to start somewhere and you must align this to process. So the best thing you can do is look at wherever you have the most pain points in your organization. Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it operations? Is it supply chain? Wherever the case may be, you can leverage data sets, internal and external, to make better decisions going forward. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Taylor Brown, who's going to take us through a bit of a history of this industry and explain how we got here, and then talk a bit about what you can do next. So with that, Taylor, take it away. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, and, uh, and and that was a, a great intro to exactly what I'm going to go through. Um, so appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's having a good day so far. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think what I wanted to, to go into today is just uh, talking about a brief history of data warehousing, ETL, and BI, and, and kind of data governance around that. Um, and so uh, I thought it'd be interesting to really, you know, go through the last, you know, 18 years of, of what has changed in each of these different uh, individual pieces of the BI stack. Um, and so, you know, a few things I want to just, you know, get out in front is um, I'm just kind of looking at the history of trends um, and that dates I'm throwing out here are somewhat rough. So I don't necessarily hold me exactly to them, but it's kind of like roughly the time that I, that I felt these, uh, you know, these dates were, were applicable. Um, so let's start with the 2000s. Uh, just to get you guys warmed up with what this, what this, the 2000s were, that was year 2000 was when the pink razor came out, and also uh, the the initial uh, iPad. Um, so those that's kind of sets the scene a little bit. Um, and here's what the data stack looked like. I mean, it was a somewhat complicated uh, data stack. Uh, there was. Um, you know, mostly all custom systems, the service systems that, you know, the, the companies were, were leveraging or using were, um, you know, enterprise on-premise custom applications. Um, and, uh, you know, companies were loading into uh, the data warehouse using, you know, classic ETL, uh, and then they were loading to data marts and cubes, uh, typically OAuth cubes. And then they were querying directly, you know, in their reporting tools from there. So that was like the general, you know, what the stack looked like. Um, you know, from here, uh, you know, just looking at like the 2000s, what was the warehouse at this point? Um, and it was really there, like, you know, there was a cube. Uh, and so cubes were often, or OLAP cubes were often set up uh, for faster dashboards and reporting and used to overcome performance limitations in row store databases, uh, especially in data models that contain hundreds or thousands of columns. Um, so lab cubes boosted the speed of analytical queries uh, in row store databases by limiting the amount of uh, irrelevant data that needed to be scanned. Um, so by defining schemas and data structures, uh, the dashboard could easily access the data that needed and answer uh, the queries. So, you know, that, that's kind of setting the stage. Uh, and, you know, I think at that point, typically the, the infrastructure is pretty slow, fairly expensive. Um, to you know, put that in context, the cost for one gigabyte was around uh, $7.70. Um, so keep note of that because you will continue to see that drop over time. Um, so, uh, in the 2000s, the data pipeline, uh, what, what did the data pipeline look like? Um, this is really just to extract, transform, and load. Um, so think Informatica or custom code, uh, heavily, you know, with heavily customized pipelines, um, you know, you're, you're mapping the, the types, the columns, the, the tables, uh, you're transforming data prior to loading it into, you know, the OAP cubes or into the warehouse. Um, and all the aggregations were also being performed within the pipeline. So it was a, it was a somewhat complex system, but it, it, at that point, really needed to be complex because all the sources that they were pulling from and loading to were also extremely complex. Um, and what did the data governance layer look like? I mean, it, uh, these systems were very hardened systems. Um, and so there's a lot of centralized planning that went into effect. Um, and so there was actually really good data governance. Um, you know, I think there was pretty good control and oversight into, you know, what, uh, what everyone was looking at um, and, and, you know, how, how the companies were defining their metrics um, and data security. Um, and what did the BI tools look like? I mean, you know, at this point, it was really these heavy monolithic BI tools that were kind of focused around reporting. And so you have the Cognos, the Hyperion, the MicroStrategy of the world. Um, these are really focused at that point. We're really only able to ask the question of like, what happened? What happened in the past? Um, and uh, they were extremely accurate and very, you know, detailed, um, but they were very inflexible. And so, um, you know, they were very, you know, they're hardened systems and they would take months to change or update. They would take years to build. Uh, There's a tremendous amount of uh, planning at that point. Uh, and, um, you know, this is kind of in, in pursuit of the waterfall development. You sit down and plan everything out to a T, you build it, 
um, across all of your teams, uh, and and you get to uh, you know these these very detailed reports. Um, but those reports are really you know mostly aimed at the C-suite, um, and it was a really a top-down approach to to BI. Um, there's also a pretty high cost of ownership at this point. You know all these tools are are fairly expensive. Um, so just looking at the total tools, like if you just you break down what are the number total number of tools that you're looking at here, you know, there's somewhere between five, five plus tools that you have minimum in terms of your entire data stack. So just keep that in reference. It's the number of tools, the more tools, the more complexity, the more uh, you obviously these these things need to interact with each other. Um, so you know that's something to point out here. Also in terms of the teams that were that you know needed to be involved in these BI uh, you know setups. It was, uh, you know, you had your executive and management team at the top. You had your project management team. Um, you also had, you know, engineering, IT, and then the analyst. And then at the very end, you had the business users. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, these heavily complicated team structures that relied on a tremendous amount of communication um, really relied on, uh, you know, making sure that communication was great. Um, and that was where a lot of these systems, I think, became more complex uh, because they relied on so much of this communication. So, for instance, you know, you have an end user who needed a specific metric or um, a specific, uh, they were looking at a specific, uh, you know, yeah, metric, and they would ask the analyst for it. Analysts would come up with exactly how they wanted to aggregate this, and they would understand, okay, this is how I want it to be in the cube. They would pass it off to project management. Project management would pass that to IT. IT would pass that to engineering. Um, so, you know, there was just a lot of you know, kind of games of, uh, uh, you know, basically a game of telephone that was going on there. And, you know, oftentimes engineering would potentially aggregate something differently than the analyst wanted to. So by the time we got back to the analyst, the analyst would say, no, this isn't correct. You know, so it was just like kind of constant back and forth. So uh, as I'm kind of pointing out here, there's really just, a huge game of tele you know, telephone going on here, and there's a high cost of communication and a high cost of planning. Um, so let's let's continue into 2006, um, and you know, uh, you know the 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 ways of like scalability were supported, um, and the pre-computed structures such as star schemas, um, the difficulty of changing the structure of the database, and the need for experts. Our experts to configure and administer the data warehouse and eventually led to a fair amount of frustration. So just like all this orchestration and uh, all this planning, and you know, I think eventually people were like, all right, I'm kind of just really fed up with this. Um, and so, you know, what are the, the, the challenges of, uh, of kind of the OLAP? Um, it's really the, the need to pre-compute and maintain secondary data structures, i.e. the, the cubes, the indexes, impact uh, the data avail availability. Um, and then adding new data or uh, corrections meant recomputing summaries and aggregates. Um, also, you can't see new data until the rebuild is complete, so that's you know that's, that takes time. Um, and then adding dimensions allowed end users the insight they demanded, um, but there was, that came with a compromise. Um, and so the trade-off, you know, uh, the most needed dimensions against capacity limitations and tightening you know, batch windows. And so it was like this constant give and take of like. Do we do we allow more dimensions here, or are we you know you know do we do we try to tighten it down a little bit for capacity uh, concerns? Um, and then the ever increasing data volumes exacerbated the limits of the cube, uh, and the restore that really could only scale up by leveraging increasing esoteric with expensive storage and server hardware. So it's like all right, let's just throw more money at, at the hardware here, and you know, obviously that becomes expensive as well. So those are, those are like the really big challenges, um, and. So, you know, 2006 is, the, you know, kind of the, the uh, what happens at the warehouse is the column store MPP, uh, excuse me there, it should be MPP on-prem DB comes out. And so um, the column store is designed for analytical queries. Um, so massive parallel processing, MPP, like, you know, divides up the queries between nodes and cluster, and each one of these, you know, does a portion of the work. This is like, you know, this is, this was a huge kind of, I think, revolution here. Um, and so it was that you were able to kind of remove the, the cube from the equation. You have the, you know, the, and then you have Teradata, HP Vertica, the Tiza, Oracle. Um, and so the, this was a huge kind of introduction into the space here. Um, so what did the stack then look like? It, you know, still somewhat looked like the 2000s. There, you know, there wasn't necessarily a, um, a cube then. It was, there were still data marts and there were still, you still have your business rules and, 
um, there's still, you know, a, a number of different constituents that were involved here. So you had still your executive team, your project management team, your engineering, your IT analysts, business users. Um, so five, five plus tools or more, um, and still like six plus teams. Um, so, you know, pretty, you know, still pretty heavy handed there and a lot of communication that's having to go on. Um, so what happens, you know, next uh, 2008, uh, along with development of MPP technology, the rigidity of the monolithic BI stacks were starting to become a little too um, constricting for businesses. So uh, this is where the self-serve BI comes out. Um, and, you know, really we go from a point of where you're just asking what happened in the past to um, kind of asking, uh, you know, why did this happen? Um, and really looking at the present moment, like what's happening right now. Um, and so you're looking at like Tableau and Quick, and that you're really allowing your users to drill down, explore, um, you know, these are still somewhat in data silos. Um, and, but, you know, it, the, one of the big challenges that, 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 you know, those data silos kind of start to bring up is there's multiple versions of, of the truth here. Um, but, you know, this is definitely something that I think was driven by, you know, the business team saying, I, I want more, you know, free access to this. Um, I don't want these long cycles of having to go back and ask, uh, you know, ask the engineering IT teams to, you know, continue to change and update things. Um, so from a data governance standpoint, you know, there's more data, uh, there's more consumers, there's more, there's more complex data, uh, there's now multiple versions of the truth, so, the, and the decentralized the yeah, tools for data governance kind of end up being a little bit more of like herding cats. There's, you know, everyone's accessing it from different places. People are, you know, are passing CSVs and, and things around all over the place. Uh, and so there's all these uh, data governance tools that start to crop up to say, like, how do we control this a little bit? How do we, how do we make sure we have, you know, good quality data and, and, and data security across our organization? So that's kind of, you know, the, 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 the result of this uh, self-serve BI. So 2011, um, or actually, yeah, so 2011, uh, actually, when, one other thing I forgot to mention here is just also, you know, I think the, the thing that, that companies start to recognize is that um, instead of, of trying to, uh, you know, only have technology for, for doing their, uh, their data governance, there's a lot of policy-centric approaches that start to crop up, and so businesses, um, you know, focus on creating policies um, for their data models and, and data quality standards and data security and lifecycle management. And that, I think, is a critical uh, evolution in, in data governance. Um, so that's kind of a big one to point out here. So 2011, speeding along here. Uh, they, um, the challenges with on-prem uh, MPP console warehouses start to crop up. Uh, so the arrival of big data really puts the MPP data warehouse to the test. Uh, and it's not really due to the volume, it's because, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, like, really, like, MPP data warehouses can scale very, very high. Um, but the bigger problem was really the variety of big data and the vast array of new types of analytics, um, some of which were not easy to do inside of the data warehouse. So this is kind of the, the new big challenge, saying, so okay, shoot, um, you know, now what do we do? So, introduction, Hadoop, um, boom. So, Hadoop, you know, was originally developed around 2006. It started to take hold 2009, 2010, 2011. That's why I said the dates are a little bit um, vague here. But, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, let's say 2011, Hadoop really kind of comes to the rescue and says, all right, great, this is a fantastic potential answer to our problems because it can scale to big data, it can handle all different forms of data, um, and allow lots of different types of analytics. So it's like, ooh, we finally, I think, maybe found something that's going to work for, you know, for our challenges and something that could potentially work for a long time, um, which, is, which is really exciting. Um, so when you look at the Hadoop stack, it's like you have your operational source systems and logs, things like that. You then load it into uh, Hadoop, and then you're transforming. Either you can do that in Hadoop or you can do that um, you know, using you can still the same sorts of tools like informatic and things like that. Um, and then you you have got Hive or you know Spark one of these on top of it, um, and those they're then pumping over to your data warehouse and also your analytics tools. Um, so that's kind of what the the stack starts to look like. You still have six plus tools, um, so it's not that the stack has gotten any simpler. Um, it's just kind of shifted the 
you know, the way I think, you know, companies are doing it. Uh, and then, you know, there's still the same number of, of, you know, constituents involved. You have executive team, you have a project management, engineering, IT, analysts, and business users. So that hasn't really shifted all that much yet. Um, and so uh, fast forward to 2013, um, you know, things keep ch chugging along here. And um, unfortunately, you know, we start to run into some issues with Hadoop. Um, you know, I think that the you know, Hadoop, Hadoop turns out to be like a great, um, you know, initial, initially it seems to be great, but, you know, it, it, because most it's easy to dump data into Hadoop, into a you know, Hadoop data lake, but then it's hard to manage and, you know, extract value from that data. So, you know, there's complicated low level setup and a, a tremendous amount of maintenance um, and cost. Uh, and then it, requ you know, requires experienced development teams to, to work with Hadoop and really get the most out of it. Um, so ultimately companies end up sending a lot of their, you know, data from Hadoop into a SQL database for analytics. And that's like, if you go, you know, back here, it's like that's where, you know, the Hive, the Spark, you know, these sorts of tools are then going into your data warehouse and your analytics tools are running off of that. Um, so I think that ends up being like kind of a, you know, a bit of a dead end to some degree. Um, so, you know, it's like it doesn't really solve the big data problem. And it also doesn't really solve the data warehousing problem um, for analytics. So, you know, it's, it's, it ends up, um, yeah, again, being a bit of a dead end. So what comes next? Uh, well, right at this time um, in 2013, M, yeah, MPP column store moves to the cloud with Redshift. So uh, AWS, um, you know, forks part, sell, and launches it in their cloud. And they're really just a first mover. Um, you know, they still have, you know, uh, uh, Redshift is, is really it's still a system that was designed for on-premise. Um, but by moving it to the cloud, it makes it a little bit more accessible, definitely makes it cheaper. Um, and so this is something that, that really, uh, you know, I think takes off for the, for the entire, you know, industry. They say, okay, great, we're, let's, let's move, you know, let's move to the cloud here, or let's start to move to the cloud here and start moving some workloads here. So it's fast, it's affordable, it's enterprise data warehouse, it's on AWS, like, fantastic. Um, you know, it's definitely less expensive than on-premise column stores, and it really allows the, you know, mid-market and smaller S&B companies to, to start leveraging in that as well, which is, those were, you know, really kind of not possible before because of the price constraints. Um, you know, it's fairly easy to resize clusters, um, and if you also look, you know, the cost of, of a gigabyte, gigabyte of data is now at five cents. So, you know, in the last, uh, in the last, you know, 13 years, uh, the, the cost has dropped about $7.65 for one gigabyte of data, which is, is, uh, is pretty great, you know, and that, and that really is a, a bit, pretty big shift there. Um, so the other big thing that happens around this time is the cloud native self-service BI. So we had kind of self-service BI with Tableau and now, but now, you know, that was, or Tableau and, and you know, the 2008 quick, those sorts of tools. But um, I think, you know, what companies were really looking for uh, is a little bit more of, um, of, of a cloud native tool. So the, you know, decentralized nature of the desktop self-service BI posted large organizational challenges. Um, so cloud native BI was born. Um, and it's really driven by massive infrastructure changes coming from the cloud platforms like AWS and tools like Looker want to be collaborative, centralized, and focused on data governance. Um, you know, and, and I think that another big thing that's happening here is, you know, the data is no longer like a competitive advantage, um, but it's a standard. And it's really, it's a disadvantage if you're not fully utilizing your data. Um, and so I think this is kind of like a, a, a shift in the, in the paradigm where before, you know, everyone had to kind of be using data. If you really were using it well, you had a huge competitive advantage. Now it's like, if you're not using it, you're really just kind of behind the curve. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the key thing for, for this, this cloud native self serve BI was, you know, centralizing it, making it collaborative. Um, you know, and, and I think for the first time, we're no longer looking at the past or the present with, with data. We're trying to predict the future as best we can. Um, and that's difficult, but it's, it's starting to allow that. And part of that's just through accessibility, right? You're, you have more people using it, you have more people looking at it, and more people saying, how can I use this to, like, help myself and help us plan and, and help us put goals together and things like that. Um, the other big thing, you know, with the uh, cloud 
native self-serve BIs. It's, uh, it's allows you to have a single version of the truth. Um, so you don't have as many of the challenges that you had before where you're, you have a, a bunch of siloed, um, you know, self-serve BI. Uh, you have it all kind of focused around one particular uh, point here. Um, and, you know, full band accessibility and none of anything is like super fast query right here you know, directly against the data warehouse. So this is like the big revolution in the BI side of things. Um, so it's great. So it brings us to 2015, and um, of course, there's always challenges. So if you look, you know, the um, it, it kind of you know we you know we it feels like 2013 was really like all right, great, we're, we're really close to data nirvana. We're like we're almost there. We almost have the perfect stack together. And cloud is really starting to work out for us. We now have the MPP in the cloud, but but. You know, I think people start to see some of the challenges with, you know, Redshift in particular, and, and um, I think, you know, this is just a, a, a survey that, um, that a company called Intermix did, uh, and, you know, just of, of, you know, companies that were leveraging uh, Redshift, and it, the problem were like, hey, our queries are too slow, our dashboards are slow, Redshift is a black box, like, you know, we're growing, I'm afraid our current Redshift stack won't scale, like, you know, it's just some of the issues with, with Redshift, and, and I think the challenge here, uh, you know, Redshift by all means is a fantastic warehouse, and it will scale very well. Um, but I think the market had a slightly different appetite. Um, you know, I think the market was was interested more in a you know a little bit more of a managed system that you could plug and play and not have to you know go in and do the DBA type work. Um, and I think the other issues with Redshift are just because it uh, it's not really cloud native, so it was designed for on premise, and so it doesn't separate compute from store. Um, it's not really easily scalable up and down. I mean, you can resize, but that's a bit of a pain. Um, you know, single queries, single queue queues for your queries is also a huge issue. So, you know, it, it downgrades poorly when you have like a lot of producers and consumers of data. Um, you know, it's really difficult to manage the, the cluster and you have to, you know, you have to do these really complicated workload management rules and you have to run lots of vacuums and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not exactly as flexible for the needs of a lot of the data teams. Um, you know, it's better than what was before, but I think there's still an appetite for, for increase, uh, you know, a better solution here. Um, so in zero the 2015s, you know, this is when the cloud native column store MPP data warehouses come out. And, um, you know, I think data teams want new levels of flexibility to adopt to the needs of workloads. Uh, and to support self-service and simplified administration through automation. So you have Snowflake, you have Google BigQuery, you have Azure SQL Data Warehouse come onto the market, um, and you have this you know, separation of compute and storage, which is really vital uh, to to the success of of the MPP warehouse. And you know, I think um, there's also zero infrastructure management. So they really thought through, like, okay, what do people want here? What what do our customers really want? And and I think they really nailed that one on the head. Um, you know, the other big things are these these tools support structured and unstructured data, whereas um, the older tools like you know like like uh, Redshift didn't re didn't really handle say JSON all that well, um, or the unstructured data all that well. Um, and the last thing is it's instantly scalable and can deal with compute. So you can go up and go down very quickly. Um, so if we just take a, a very you know a little slightly deeper dive into what this exactly means. You have separation of compute and storage. Like, so now you have uh, a single, you know, S3 layer or you know, Google Cloud Storage layer with essentially infinite storage that you're then running as your as your storage layer, and then you have your um, your your queries running against a, a leader node here in your your MPP. Um, and so the data is copied onto the nodes in the cluster, at, at, you know, at time of compute, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then. You know, this really solves the, the queue issue. So you can have multiple different consumers or producers in your company that are all reading off the same data sets. So you don't have to have you know, multiple data sets and, and silos happening here. You can all work off the same thing. So you have your, maybe your ETL running through one of these. You have your, you know, finance team running through another and BI runs another. And, you know, say BI for accident, you know, accidentally does some, you know, crazy queries that, that end up taking down their whole cluster. That's perfectly fine. Like, I mean, it sucks for everyone who's using BI, but your finance team won't go down and the ETL won't go down. So this is a, this is a huge advance in, in the space. It just makes life a lot easier. There's a lot less you have to, you know, handle in terms of orchestration across teams and things like that, because they used to be a little bit independent while also still working out the same data set. 
Um, and now that needs yeah, elastic compute. So you can resize a cluster in seconds and just you know, add more nodes. Let's go, let's go crazy. Be like, hey, we know it's, it's Black Friday. We know we're gonna have a tremendous amount of traffic and, and we're gonna have a tremendous amount of purchases going through our system. Let's scale this thing up. We, let's, you know, let's do what it needs, um, which is great. And then you can scale back to Cyber Monday or whatever you need. Um, so that's really the flexibility that, and the agility that that the the newer teams uh, and the you know the newer you know just uh, companies really need not even newer companies just like people need in general at this day and age in in kind of the you know the the way we're running our businesses. Um, so the last thing, and I'll just point this out, is just kind of a huge perk here is is data sharing. So data sharing is you know, one of the other perks of having all of the your data running off of these you know, S3 data sources so you can share across different companies. Like uh, we, my training can share with Acmeco or can share with Bob Slumming or whatever. Um, and I, you know, I think this is still fairly early and that there isn't a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, of, of people, companies let, you know, let, you know, leveraging this quite yet. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that we should keep an eye on this because I think this is gonna turn into a really great way of, of sharing data um, around. So far out, man. <laughs> How does that affect ETL? Um, so, you know, I think that the, uh, the thing here is uh, just to go over the recap of everything I've gone, I've gone through in the last, you know, 20 slides or whatever. If you look, you know, warehouses gone through and have gone through a number of different changes. So in 2000, OLAP to 2006, on premise, Calm Start, MVP, 2011, Hadoop, to the, uh, I should say 2013, Cloud, Column Store. Uh, 2015, uh, native column store, um, you know, BI, 2000, monolithic, uh, rigid BI, then self-service, then centralized cloud native self-service. Um, you know, to be honest, ETL hadn't really, has not really changed all that much. So, you know, I think, I guess part of the question and when I was looking at this is like, why has ETL not changed that much? And I think there's a couple reasons for this, um, but it's really, I guess, kind of time for a change. So. You know, there, there are huge challenges with ETLs from the 2000s. You know, ETL was, was optimized for slow on kind of slow lot beta warehouses. I mean, this was initially how it was designed for it. And, and there were, so there are massive storage constraints at that point. Um, you know, they're uh, you know, optimized for pulling on premise uh, enterprise applications. Um, you know, I think uh, there's just so much to change in the last 15 years. Uh, and, and the fact that ETL hasn't, um, you know, I think really indicates that there, there's a need for it to change at this point. Um, and so uh, what are some of the challenges that, you know, inherently using an ETL strategy, you know, bring up is there's still an extensive amount of setup involved uh, and there's ongoing maintenance and there's extensive planning. Uh, and I joke that, you know, oftentimes if you're, you're trying to do this, it, like, you have to plan so far in the future, you're kind of like trying to really plan the future. And that's just really difficult to do, especially in today's business environment where things are changing so quickly uh, that companies really need to be able to, to switch directions very fast. Um, and so uh, 2015 shift in the kind of company structures. And, and I, I joke here, yeah, like so hot right now. Um, I love that. So <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so, so moving to the cloud, IT teams are shrinking, um, and analysts are the, you know, the front of the self-serve BI, and they really want, you know, simple infrastructure, they want fully managed services, uh, they want kind of a more holistic control over the stack. Um, you know, they're tired of having to deal with going to all these different teams to get what they want. Um, and so data teams really want, you know, they want infrastructure that was, you know, simple to use, was, you know, SQL-based, um, can be set up and managed by themselves without a ton of overhead from themselves and from, you know, other teams that, you know, in their company. Um, and so they wanted tools to help them succeed that, you know, were just set up for, you know, for their success with the you know, overall complexity of their jobs. Um, so this is kind of a big push for this. And, and it's time, I mean, it's been 15 years, so it's like, let's, let's make some changes here. The other big things that, you know, are happening at this point are, and the rise of cloud applications, and I have this you know, tiny picture here on the left, but it shows something like you know, 5,000 marketing apps and, and marketing tools, uh, and CRM and things like that that have cropped up in the last 10 years. And so there's just a tremendous amount of, of, of new tools that companies are leveraging that are you know, highly specific for those specific needs. Um, also, the you know, drop in, in data storage now is you know, one gigabyte is, is two cents. So, you know, it's a whole, whole lot cheaper than it was 15 years ago. 
Um, and this also plays into, you know, how it works or how the ETL, you know, paradigm should shift. Uh, the last thing is just the agile workflows are really the, what companies want. They want to look quickly iterate and move, you know, as fast as possible. Um, so we dive into what what does the shift look like? And as we see it, you know, there's the classic details you see on the left where you like extract, you transform, you load, you visualize, and this is a simplified uh, that version of this. Uh, and on the right, you end up, at, you know, you go with more of a modern data stack or, or you can say an ELP stack where you extract the data, uh, you load it in a more holistic way, then you transform it and build that model edge semantic data governance layer within the warehouse. Uh, and then you're visualizing by, sh you know, by, by, by um, shipping only the results, uh, you know, running the queries against the data warehouse and then shipping the results to the browser. So super fast, let the, the workhorse, the data warehouse, just do all the, you know, all the heavy lifting there. Um, and so uh, the kind of benefits of, of this, these tech are it's the cloud, uh, ad, agile cloud native self-service analytics. Um, so you have full schema replication um, covering off, you know, off the data, you're kind of building a data lake within your data warehouse. Um, so you're not needing to add a, an extra Hadoop staff or any of those other things. You're just like, let's put it all in there. Um, we'd store it you know, in an S3 layer for a lot of these so it can scale up infinitely. Um, you're then you know, uh, putting things into like more of a standard schema here inside the warehouse. Uh, and so you're, you're building like a base table here uh, set of base tables, um, and I'll, I'll speak to why the, the, kind of that's important in it. Uh, and then you have the SQL-based modeling and transformations that are post-load, um, and then centralized and, and collaborative uh, BI layer on top of that. And so one of the reasons that, um, I, you know, I think this is a really great move is that um, it's uh, mod modularized replication, and it's kind of modularizing, it's kind of separating replication and load from transformation. Because I think that one of the largest complexities that happened in the ELT or ETL paradigm was uh, that you were extracting data, but then you're also, uh, you know, transforming it at the same time. So if you had to go back and understand, okay, where are the, you know, where are the issues coming through? Why are the metrics not exactly working out right? Or why is the wireless numbers not exactly right? You have to try and figure out and isolate, is it because of the replication code? Is it, is it because it's not correctly coming from the source? Or is it because of the aggregations that were applied or the transformations that were applied? Um, and so, you know, when you build these monolithic systems um, that are combining multiple steps, it's, you know, that, that complexity just compounds. And, and it just makes everything harder to try and figure out. And so this system really separates those two and says, okay, great. The replication is its own thing and the transformation is its own thing. And that really, um, you know, it allows uh, you to have really a, a fantastic break there. Um, and, you know, you have this then semantic layer that you can run data governance on and you can have a single version of the truth. Uh, and it also just simplifies your stack. So you're now down to like three teams, right? So you don't have to have engineering necessarily. You don't have to have IT or project management. We have analysts that can essentially run most of this stack. Um, they understand how the data warehouses works. The data warehouse is fully managed, so it's not like they really need IT to oversee that. Um, the extraction processes using a tool like Pipefan um, is 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 like you know is designed for analysts to set up and, and very fast for them to get working with without the help of engineering or IT. And then you have your business users and your executive team management. Um, that are at the bottom, but there's not necessarily a whole lot of interface that needs to happen there. There's not a tremendous amount of communication. The, you know, the analyst obviously still needs to work on making sure they get the data governance part right, and they'll work with the executive team, and they'll, they'll, you know, with, on that whole thing. But then it's really like, okay, let's get it out to the rest of the company, let's let them use it, and let's not worry about them, you know, mishandling or misusing it in some way. Um, because you have that really strong centralized transformation data, data governance layer. Um, and so kind of just to recap, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been all these changes that happen in the warehouse, in BI, and really, you know, I, I argue that, you know, ETL is, 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 is ripe for change and, and we're seeing just the, you know, just the tip of this happening right now and, and a lot of companies moving over to doing this. Um, so quick, you know, last few minutes, just want to give a, a very fast plug to, to Fivetrack. Like what is it we do and, and, and why to, you know, bring all this up? Um, so Fivetrack fixed this whole thing because we're at, data replication tool. So it's like for zero configuration, zero maintenance data pipelines. 
um, you know, so PyTrain helped to achieve data accessibility with the zero configuration, zero maintenance data pipelines. We pull the data from the source for you in a you know, matter of, you know, you connect with a, you know, authentication. We, we pull all the data and load it into the warehouse and, and continue to keep it up to date. So, you know, we'll pull, up, we'll pull from applications, databases, files, events, really wherever you have data, we'll load it into, um, you know, typically wherever you have business data, um, and we'll load into your warehouse. So there's Snowflake, Google BigQuery, Amazon Redshift, um, Microsoft Azure, and, and a plethora of other ones. Um, and we support from, from in terms of sources, uh, I think this list is even outdated. We're adding about, you know, two to four per month. But we have a long, long list of applications. Some of the you know, popular ones are like Google AdWords, Google Analytics, Marketo, NetSuite, um, Salesforce, Zendesk, Zora, um, databases, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, SQL Server. Um, you know, and that there's actually a longer list of that, those as well. Files you can grab from like Amazon S3, FTP, FTPS, SFTP. Um, we do support email, so you can like email reports to us, and we'll automatically grab those and upload them. Um, we're just, I think this is more of like a toolkit for your analyst team to help get the data from all different places that need it into the warehouse um, without having to call on your, uh, the rest of your engineering team. Um, so how does it work? Uh, the way it works is you authenticate and what you do the rest. So say we connect to a system like Salesforce, um, we, you authenticate it uh, for us, and you give us access to, to pull data on your behalf. We pull all the historical data, we, run, we normalize that data, uh, we create the schemas and tables for you in the warehouse, uh, then we load that data, and then we continue to keep it up to date on, um, say, a five-minute interval. Um, in terms of the normalization behavior, this is, you know, a bit in the weeds, but I think a lot of people, this is, this is important for them. Um, we have kind of two different levels of, of normalization that we're doing. For, uh, for data that comes out fairly denormalized, so we're talking like APIs that are, that are you know, sending very denormalized data in, in JSON sets, we actually will we spend a lot of time to uh, normalize that data into uh, into a great schema for our customers, uh, so they can just you know start working directly on top of that. They don't even need to generally build a, a modeling layer in the, in the warehouse. They can just drop their BI tool directly into that. Um, and then for normalized schemas coming from like databases and um, and, and places like Salesforce and NetSuite, um, because they're so customized, we we just replicate those as is. So you get, you know, essentially a direct replica of what you have in your source into the warehouse. Um, the other big thing that we, we offer is standard schemas for our, for our standard schemas are ERDs. Uh, and so these are great because you know exactly what you're going to get. You can plan ahead of time. You don't have to just set it up and, 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 um, and, and hope that you're going to get something great. Um, the other good thing is that we do very exhaustive uh, pulls. So we, we pull everything by default. Um, so it's not this kind of, Game of telephone again, where you where you know you have your analyst and your analyst is like, I need this one table, and they come in the engineering team, and you know, you know, add my one table, and then the next day they need another table, and it's like this game back and forth. It's like, no, we just pull everything by default, um, and then you can turn off tables if you want to for some reason. We can turn off columns or things like that if you need to for GPR purposes or whatever. Um, but that uh, you know, that sync all by default, I think, is a really critical component of, of us. Um, and then last, you know, in the last few minutes, just one or two. Uh, how the update process works. So we, you know, only do an incremental update process. Um, this is by default. When you insert, we insert, we update, we update, we delete, we don't delete. Um, we'll mark it as deleted and archive that. Um, we're working on some other, you know, things in, 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 terms, of, in terms of expanding this. Um, and then we also do automatic schema migration. So we add a column, we add a column, you remove a column, we don't remove a column, but you give them, uh, you know, alert on that. And when you change the data type, we'll change uh, the, the data type in the warehouse as well. Um, and when you add an object, you add an object, remove an object, you don't remove it at this point. Um, but that handles a tremendous amount of the complexity, I think, um, so that you really don't have to worry about anything. Um, you know, these old, the old ETL types of systems, if something changes the source, you know, that would break everything in your ETL. You'd have to have your team essentially go through and fix all that stuff, uh, and that can slow down, uh, you know, your entire pipeline or all of your analytics for days or weeks or months at times. Um, so this allows you to stay extremely agile, continue to make all those changes that you need to make in the source, and not worry about your, your downstream BI. Um, so I'll leave you kind of with one last thing here is just, you know, complexity compounds. Um, and so I suggest you automate, standardize, and simplify as much of you, uh, your, your stack as you can. And I think that this is one great way of doing it. Um, so that's it. That's all I've got. Um, I think the last thing I was going to is like, what's coming next? Uh, question marks. You know, I think I love feedback, questions, thoughts. My email is taylor at 5 I'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, I, I think we should open up 
for, for questions, Eric. Yep, and no, that's a great presentation. I love the history and I love the fact that you kind of draw these lines to where the inflection points occurred. And I think the challenge that we face today is that we have multiple inflection points that are all coalescing. And uh, that's gonna create mm -hmm. some interesting opportunities, but some pretty significant challenges for how to move forward. And uh, to that point, we do have a number of good questions here from the audience. One, uh, let me throw this one over at you. One of the attendees asks, why normalize? Should the standard schemas be normalized or denormalized? What do you think about that? Um, I would say that, that um, kind of textbook data warehousing is to, is to normalize them. Because when you, when you denormalize them, oftentimes you're gonna end up with duplicate versions. So that's like single, um, single source of truth. Um, you know, I think in a, you know, in a, you'd like, it's better to have a single source of truth so that you don't have multiple teams working off of, you know, multiple data sets that are all uh, overlapping that have denormalized data. Okay, good. And uh, there are a couple questions around data governance. You know, I'm glad that you brought that into the mix because data governance obviously gets more important by the day. And I think what you mm -hmm. talked about with mitigating or, or limiting the amount of transformation that occurs, that's actually a, a fairly significant component of the data governance landscape. But still, the, the question is, where do you where do you handle data governance? And I think it's it's sort of an end-to-end -end process, right? You have to have bits and pieces of protocol woven in, but if you don't transform a lot of the data as you load it, that at least helps to kind of stabilize the whole picture. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, I think there's still kind of two places that you can add data governance. I'm gonna go back up just so I can use something here. Um, so I think uh, I think if you, if you look at it, um, there's essentially the point where you're extracting data out of the warehouse or out of the sources, and then there's the point where you're, you're transforming it. And I think that you have the opportunity at both of those places to do data governance. Um, so what I mean why when you're extracting it, that's when you can decide what do we want to make sure we don't have in the warehouse. Like this is like security or GDPR, things like that. You may want to decide, hey, I don't want to load any PII into my warehouse. Or you may decide like I want to hash or I want to obfuscate that data in some way so that you know, I'm not worried about the security issues downstream. Um, I'm not worried about all of the consumers that we have against, you know, in that warehouse. That's like, that's point one, and Fivetran definitely can help with that. Um, and then I'd say the second half in terms of thinking about data quality, um, you know, centralization of your metrics, of, of the way you're defining things like revenue, uh, I would say that should happen at that, at that transformation layer. Um, and that's where you are building you know, these uh, dimensional tables uh, within the warehouse that you then are pointing your BI to. Um, so that, uh, those, those are kind of the two locations I would say it, it works out in the current setup. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, one of the attendees is asking about timeliness and how real time can you get in this environment? I'm guessing you can get pretty real time. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really depends on um, which warehouse you're loading into because, you know, and you know, the, the, the column store warehouses, um, you know, like, like Redshift, for instance, because it only has a single queue, they can be, get backed up really quickly. Um, tools like, like Snowflake, for instance, you know, you can get them down their latency down to like minutes or seconds. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's not quite there where it's, where it's like we're in the middle of seconds. Um, because the, you know, it's still a column store data warehouse, so it's not really designed for that, but it's getting pretty darn close and, and you can definitely get it to a pretty fast speed. Okay, that sounds good. And you, know, you talked about um, efficiency of making changes. Are you, are you formally using change data capture as part of this architecture? One attendee is asking. Uh, yes, I mean, we, so, we do use data, um, change data capture when pulling off of the databases. So we're reading off of the logs from all the databases. So for like MySQL, it's off of the, uh, the bin logs and, and Oracle, it's the, um, the uh, log miner, I think. And so we are doing change data capture there. Um, and for the date, for, for, for pulling from sources that are, that are APIs, I mean, we're just pulling for changes every so often, every few minutes. Um, so multiple changes can happen between those pulls, which we can't see because, uh, but, you know, that, that's kind of just inherent in the way that, that the API setup is, but we will, we will definitely pull all those changes and capture those where we can. 
Okay, good. And uh, we have a question about um, large organizations, especially government organizations that are not allowed to use the cloud. What can you do for those organizations, like defense companies, for example? Sure. Um, I mean, at this point, FiveTrain doesn't have a, a, a fantastic story about that. I mean, I think we're very focused on cloud. Um, you know, at some point, perhaps we may, you know, move to offering something that's a little bit more on-prem. But to be honest, you know, we've just seen so many companies that are really just focusing on going to cloud. So it's, it's silly for us to create an on-premise offering where we're just loading to the cloud. And then specifically when they're coming a lot of times from a cloud source like Salesforce, and then it'd be like, go, you know, from cloud to on-premise to cloud again. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a great answer to that question, but I, I guess the, we're not exactly super focused on it at this time. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. You have to focus on where you excel, and I think, frankly, that's going to be a hallmark of the information economy going forward because you can design software from anywhere and deploy it pretty much anywhere. Companies such as yours mm -hmm. really have to focus on their key differentiator, right? You have to focus on what you're doing well and realize that there are segments of the market that you, you won't be able to capture right away. But that's a good point. Mm -hmm. We have one question about, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on this, because I've been tracking um, Apache Drill for some time, and I've seen how they made some really good advances, and I think kind of had to go back to the drawing board as I recur. Are you familiar with Apache Drill, and how do you think it fits into the broader picture of, of understanding large data sets? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with it. I mean, I know I have a cursory understanding of it. Um, I don't, I don't want to speak to it in depth. Um, I, yeah, I can definitely look at it deeper if, if that individual wants to just email me. Um, you know, okay. I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to speak to it uh, knowledgeably. No, that makes sense. Okay, here's another good question about metadata. On the, one of the attendees asked, on the extract load step, do you also create metadata about the specific load, such as date, time, source, et cetera? I'm sure that's all baked in, right? Yeah, we so we have a pretty granular uh, logging system that will log all of the information that's happening, um, even within FiveTrain systems. So FiveTrain, you can think of, uh, I would say, as a glass box. So there's not a whole lot you can do inside a FiveTrain system. I mean, it's fully managed. We're sitting there 24 hours a day watching it. Um, and But we want to give you guys information as to what's happening. So we'll give you the time that we call the API. We'll give you the particular even query sometimes that we're querying against that. Um, we'll we'll you know, log how long it's taking for the response to happen, how long it's taking to, to process this data, how long it takes to load into the warehouse, um, so that you have very granular information uh, on, on every step that's happening within Python. And we actually will load that log data into whatever log system you're using. So if you're using, like, CloudWatch, if you're using, you know, some other logging system, we can actually send those logs to you so you can put those right into the log system you're already using. Okay, good. And uh, here's a really good detailed question from an attendee uh, who asks, if the source's schema doesn't track changes over time, will you add that capability to your schema or will only the latest values exist in the warehouse? Um, so we automatically have our own system for tracking the schema. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we aren't passing any sort of metadata about the schema, especially when we are creating a schema ourselves. Because a lot of times we'll get these you know, denormalized data sets coming from APIs, and we, we will, you know, transform them into a much better, more normalized uh, schema in the warehouse. And in order to do that, we track the schemas very closely. So we'll track all the columns. We'll know exactly what we've seen before, what we haven't seen before, um, what happens if a column gets dropped. Like, we know very closely what's happening with the schema. Okay, good. Well, folks, so we burned through a solid hour here. We have a few more detailed questions. We'll be sure to pass those on to Taylor. But, yes, we do archive all these webinars for later viewing. Uh, we will have an email that goes out on Friday with some details about all that. And uh, I guess any closing comments from you, um, Taylor, about where things are going? What are you working on next? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the warehousing space continues to evolve. I think the, the transformation layer in the warehouse is pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for us, uh, we're really focused on still just continuing to, to make the most reliable product and, and support the most number of connections because, as I showed on that slide, there's, there's 5,000 of them right now, and we've got, you know, what, of 80 or so, so we've got a long way to go. Yeah, that's my space, too, and it really is fun and exciting to watch this all pan out. I think you guys are playing a, a really valuable role in allowing us to move through what is a very dynamic 
and turbulent period of time in the information management space. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Shannon Kemp to take us out. Thanks again. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks to Fivetran. And thanks to all of you for your great questions today. We'll get them all to Taylor to uh, get you some answers. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Taylor. And uh, and Eric, you pretty much said it all. So thanks to all of our attendees for everything today. Thanks to you guys for this great presentation. Um, and just a reminder, as Eric mentioned, and this, uh, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Friday with links to the slides, links to the recording um, of this session as well. And we hope to see you uh, in more deep dive ra uh, DM radio webinars. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.